Hello, today is Wednesday, February 13th, 2019. I'm Joe Schmidt with TC2, and this is Staying Connected. I'm joined today by my LB3 colleagues, Laura McDonald and Kevin DeLallo, who are both senior partners at LB3. The three of us recently wrote a paper that looks at the 10 things enterprises need to watch for in 2019, because these things will impact your technology and purchasing roadmap. Network World is publishing some of the content from the paper and we'll push the entire paper out to our clients in the coming weeks. On uh, today's podcast, we'll discuss two of the pieces from the paper. The first takes a look at GDPR and our view that it may someday become the global privacy standard. And the second, and I guess somewhat related piece, questions if Congress in the U.S. will finally adopt federal privacy legislation. Okay, Laura and Kevin, thanks for taking the time to join me today. Joe, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. I think our listeners will really enjoy reading the paper that we wrote because it combines LB3's legal views of the most current topics with TC2's insights from a technical and business perspective. Yeah, I agree. I think it's a really good paper. So, Kevin, you took the lead on the GDPR piece. Can you give a quick overview of GDPR and the impact that it's having? Absolutely, Joe. As most of our listeners are probably aware, 2018 was the year that enterprises all around the world begrudgingly accepted heightened data privacy obligations to European community residents and regulators under the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, which took effect in May 2018. Any business that handles personal information of a European citizen is subject to the GDPR, regardless of where the business is located. The reaction of multinationals to GDPR has been fascinating to watch. To say they've taken it seriously is an understatement. So much time, effort, and money have been spent gearing up to comply with the GDPR. Some observers think it may even be overkill, but that's because the scope of the GDPR and its sanctions are unprecedented. In fact, other jurisdictions, including Brazil, Japan, and India, are considering adopting copycat legislation. In the U.S., data breaches are a matter of state rather than federal law, and most privacy compliance professionals that we know would love to replace this patchwork of requirements with a single nationwide privacy standard that U.S. companies would have to comply with. We'll talk about that issue in our next segment. And looking at a single standard, the obvious template for that would be the GDPR, as virtually all global enterprises have invested millions, probably more, as Kevin just went over, in understanding what are their obligations and then adapting and adopting practices and procedures to minimize the risk of violations. And this is important because the GDPR can carry fines up to 4% of a company's global revenues. This may seem, the GDPR as a template may seem like an obvious solution, but in reality, you have to look at the U.S. system. We have a democratic process where there are many interests and concerns that are taken into account. You have the political parties, corporate interests, law enforcement, states versus federal, all want to assert their own solution. So as we'll discuss a little bit later, getting a unified approach in 2019 isn't impossible, but it's unlikely. Holy smokes, you said 4% of a company's global revenue. I did a quick Google search, and companies like Google and Amazon, they have global revenue that exceeds $100 billion. So that means that they could be fined $4 billion or more for a GDPR violation? Yeah, it's pretty serious stuff. And even though, as Kevin indicated, this has only really been enacted since last spring, GDPR fines have already been assessed. And and while some have been more modest, the French Data Protection Authority recently fined Google 50 million euros. So with all the recent news about significant data leaks, we would expect some more substantial fines in 2019. You know, if that doesn't motivate companies to protect user data, I, I really don't know what will. So, Kevin, what's the takeaway here? Joe, if we had to predict, we would say that several other countries will adopt GDPR-style privacy laws this year and next, while the U.S. will get bogged down in political maneuvering and probably do very little on the federal level to protect consumer privacy. But even if we do nothing in this country, widespread adoption of GDPR-style laws elsewhere will provide a strong impetus for U.S. businesses to look at GDPR as a floor rather than a ceiling in terms of compliance. The lesson for all of us is we need to take GDPR and consumer privacy generally very seriously. Okay, 
The second piece from the article that we want to cover today looks at if Congress will finally adopt federal privacy legislation. Now, based on what the rest of the world is doing with mandates like GDPR, I'm sure it's only a matter of time, but Laura, what do you think? Well, it really depends on how you classify a matter of time. Um, thanks, Joe. With the exception of the sector-specific legislation, like HIPAA, which is for healthcare providers and insurers, and Graham Leach Briley, which is for financial services providers, Congress has never enacted comprehensive privacy legislation. And as Kevin said, they've left it to the states to protect their citizens. You know, frankly, in in the wake of some of the shocking disclosures of personal data collection and the brokering that's been done by companies like Facebook, Google, AT&T Mobility, and Verizon, among many others, there's been an outcry for Congress to do something to protect consumers from having their personal information collected, shared, and used in ways that they're not even aware of. But as Kevin indicated, is Congress likely to do something in 2019? Considering they couldn't even agree on a budget to keep the government open for five weeks, we predict that we'll be asking the same question next year. And further dampening our hopes for progress on this issue is the lobbying that's going on, and particularly the clout of the tech industries, and frankly, some of the naivete of the veteran lawmakers on how the digital economy really works. Joe, we hope we're wrong. For one thing, the fact that the U.S. doesn't have a nationwide data privacy standard means that U.S.-based businesses are less competitive in global markets, and there's very little incentive for companies to voluntarily do the right thing. As an example, the Federal Trade Commission recently fined Google $22.5 million for privacy violations, which the agency touted as one of the largest fines ever. But Google earns more than that in only four hours. That's what I call a slap on the wrist. In contrast, as we've already mentioned, GDPR violations can be punished with fines as high as 4% of a company's global revenues. That's the kind of fine that gets a company's attention. Another problem with the current state of play, where almost all the relevant data privacy law is on the state level, is that corporate compliance officers have to worry about complying with 50 or so different laws. A single federal mandate that preempts state law would be a godsend to compliance professionals. That's why all types of interest groups, from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to the Internet Association, plus many leading companies, are all urging Congress and the administration to take action to preempt state privacy laws. Privacy advocates, on the other hand, worry that any federal legislation would just weaken rather than strengthen state consumer privacy protection. Kevin's absolutely right. And we look to the states to see where they've tried to fill the gap left by this lack of federal legislation. For example, the new California Consumer Privacy Act, which was just enacted in June of 2018, it's a good example of the proactive measures that states are taking to fill the void. State laws, though, pose a significant compliance challenge for companies because of their breadth and lack of uniformity. The California Act, which becomes effective next January 1st, applies to all California residents, and it's similar to the GDPR in many ways, with a few important exceptions. First, the California law defines personal data more broadly than GDPR does, to include information about a household, not just about an individual. Second, instead of requiring companies to obtain consumers opt-in before selling their personal information to third parties, California's law takes the less controversial opt-out approach, meaning that the company can collect, use, and sell personal information to third parties unless the consumer opts out. Minors have to opt in either directly or, if they're under 13, through a parent or guardian. While this may not seem to be a major win for consumer privacy, under existing law, a consumer's only option, if she doesn't want a company to sell her data, is to not do business with that company. Privacy professionals predict that enterprises will struggle as much to tailor their business practices to comply with the California law as they struggle to comply with the GDPR. The time, effort, and money that U.S. businesses have invested in GDPR compliance have been nothing short of remarkable. Okay, so Laura, what's the takeaway here? Do you think that we'll see federal privacy law in the U.S. anytime soon? Joe, the takeaway is in order to have uniform federal privacy law, Congress needs to hear from corporate America. Unless and until Congress is forced to act, enterprises will be forced to continue dedicating significant resources and money to comply with unique state privacy regimes as well as foreign ones. 
Okay, thanks, Laura, and thank you as well, Kevin. Now, the three of us will be back in a few days to cover a few more of the topics we wrote about in our paper about the 10 things to watch for in 2019. In the meantime, if you do want to discuss how GDPR and U.S. privacy legislation might affect you, or if you have other ICT lifecycle needs, you can contact Laura, Kevin, me, or any of our LB3 and TC2 colleagues by giving us a call or shooting us an email. You can also stay current by checking out our websites or follow us on LinkedIn.